We have a special broadcast for you focusing on the war in Ukraine with the surprise visit to Kyiv by US President Joe Biden. Kyiv stands and Ukraine stands. Democracy stands. The Americans stand with you and the world stands with you. This is Biden's first trip to Ukraine since Russia's invasion almost a year ago, and he announced a fresh military aid package worth half a billion dollars. Also coming up on the show, we look at China's role in the war amid speculation that Beijing may be preparing to provide weapons to Russia. Plus, German-made battle tanks for Ukraine. A look at the challenges as Berlin leads a coalition to deliver Leopard 2 tanks. I'm Anya Coopers McKinnon. Welcome to this special edition of DW News. US President Joe Biden has made a surprise visit to Kyiv. He's promised to step up arms deliveries to Ukraine as its forces brace for a spring offensive by the Russian military. Biden said that the US would send another $500 million military aid package to Ukraine that will include ammunition, radar and other equipment. Now, Biden's trip comes just days before the one-year anniversary of Russia's full-scale invasion. Good morning, Mr. President. A gesture of solidarity and a vital reminder of unity between the US and Ukraine. Air raid sirens blared across the Ukrainian capital during U.S. President Joe Biden's surprise visit. There were no reports of Russian airstrikes, but the sound is still a clear reminder that Ukraine is under constant attack, making support from the U.S. more important now than ever. And I'm here to show our unwavering support for the nation's independence, their sovereignty and, uh, and territorial integrity. And, uh, Today, I hope we're going to have a chance to discuss how the United States uh, and our allies, by keeping constant contact with and our partners, can most effectively support you and your, your cause, Mr. President. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky voiced his gratitude. It's a huge moment of supporting for the Ukraine. And um, what can I say? I really appreciate that President Biden American society being from the very beginning of this tragedy, from the very beginning of this full-scale war, from the first days being together with us, first phone call of supporting was from White House to Ukraine. And thank you for your leadership, thanks bipartisan support, thanks Congress. I think that is a historical moment for our, for our country. The two presidents paid tribute at the Wall of Remembrance to the thousands of Ukrainian soldiers who have lost their lives since 2014. Biden's visit comes at a crucial moment in the war, as the U.S. needs to keep allies unified in their support for Ukraine if Ukraine is to fend off Russian offensives in the spring. We can cross straight to Kyiv, where DW's Aya Ibrahim is standing by for us. Aya, U.S. President Biden's surprise visit to Kyiv today could not have come at a more significant time, could it? Absolutely. We are just a few days away from the one-year anniversary of the war. And for a U.S. president to make it here physically to show his support for Ukraine and uh, its, its effort to defend uh, its territory is really quite um, extraordinary. And it's definitely something that people here on the streets in Kiev really appreciate. I was just out on the street talking to people. Uh, I mean, we talked to a couple, only one person had no idea that the, this trip was happening, actually. Uh, but everybody here, it's, it, you know, is very appreciative of this gesture, because obviously, as we are approaching this anniversary, there's an expectation that Russia might strike back somehow harsher and it's it does provide some reassurance there's also the speech tomorrow by uh, President Vladimir Putin a year ago when he gave that speech it was just a couple of days later that this invasion happened and so it sends quite a strong message to the people here in Kiev Anya and in the whole country
Now, President Biden issued a statement promising more support for Ukraine. Can you tell us a little bit about what he actually did promise? So it's important to remember that the United States has been the biggest supporter of Ukraine when it comes to military. Uh, President Biden hasn't really promised any new weapons. He hasn't really approved any new systems or fighter jets or anything of that sort. It's just more of what the United States has already been supplying to Ukraine. So we're talking about uh, rocket launchers, artillery, um, and the $500 million dollars um, you know, extra aid that has been promised today. I think that maybe will become, this will come as a little bit of a disappointment uh, to people here because, you know, they, from their perspective, they're fighting for their life. So as soon as they got the tanks, they're already thinking about jets. And uh, the fact that there was no talk of that today, at least on the streets, I think, is somewhat of a disappointment. But overall, people definitely appreciate the president's visit. Now, as we've been saying, this week marks a year since uh, Russia invaded Ukraine. Can you tell us how people in Ukraine are reacting to the prospect of a major Russian offensive in the coming weeks? It's certainly something that's in the air, um, but they have been, you know, they've been definitely used to this talk of an eastern uh, offensive. Uh, you know, in the past weeks, every day we hear the offensive has started, the offensive has started. So people have sort of become, I wouldn't say desensitized, but they've learned how to live with this constant threat. So just to give you an example, and this is something that you see here all the time, when there are these air raid sirens, I mean, what you're supposed to do is go into a shelter and hide until that uh, that air raid alert has uh, subsided. But people just go on with their lives as they would any other day. They've learned to live with this risk and with this danger. And so there's definitely a sense of uh, defiance on the streets of Kiev these days. Uh, but also it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's obviously a horrific anniversary. And something that people didn't really, you know, they, they didn't want it to last this long. So there's also a sense of uh, soberness in the air, I would say. DW Special Correspondent Aya Ibrahim reporting from Kyiv. Thanks so much for that, Aya. Now, the war has had a massive impact on Ukraine. Off the battlefield, thousands of civilians have been killed, although the exact death toll is unknown. Millions of people have been displaced and the Ukrainian economy is in ruins. The war has also had a major impact on the rest of the world, of course. The US has poured tens of billions of dollars into military and economic aid for Ukraine. Leaders have promised to support Ukraine as long as it takes. But there are worries that the high costs may eventually exhaust the American people's patience. OK, let's turn to Washington next and speak to DW Bureau Chief Innes Paul. Innes, uh, can you tell us what message President Biden was sending today with his visit to Kyiv? Well, President Biden could not have chosen a more symbolic place than Kiev to demonstrate the global community the ongoing uh, support uh, for Ukraine. Uh, you know, this was really an unprecedented risk uh, by President uh, Biden to cross into a country currently uh, at war and where the US does not have a military un infrastructure. So that really shows that this is a major signal uh, to the rest of the world and especially to Russia, uh, who was informed about the president's trip. So the U.S. clearly has no intention to dial back its support. Now, Biden has pledged more, more military assistance for Ukraine. But can you tell us, is American support for Ukraine still as steadfast as Biden says? Or are there signs that it might be starting to wane? Right. So given the amount of money uh, the U.S. has spent to support uh, Ukraine and Aya just has been uh, talking about it, is kind of surprising how few people really criticize uh, Biden politics outside this uh, Washington uh, bubble, which is highly politicized anyhow. Uh, so uh, we heard that uh, Biden even uh, is promising another half a billion dollar package. You know, my take is the following. As long as the economy is doing OK uh, in the United States, the majority of the Americans probably will keep supporting uh, 
the Ukrainian cause, but it will probably change once uh, the economy is weakening. And we kind of saw that during the last summer with the exploding uh, gas prices. The moment Americans have the feeling that other countries are taking more seriously than the problems within the United States, Biden indeed might have a problem. Ines, can you tell us how important this visit was for, for Joe Biden himself? So everyone here uh, in the U uh, U.S., Anya, is waiting for President Biden to announce that he will be running again in 2024. This is when the next president will be elected uh, in the United States. And one big topic, obviously, is his age. Uh, he will be 82 uh, if he wins this re-election next year. So this trip also was meant to show his strength and his power and that he is ready to run for a Another term. That's Washington Bureau Chief Innes Pool. Thanks so much for that. Now, moving on to China, which has largely been seen as a bystander as the war in Ukraine has unfolded. Chinese officials have called for peace talks and respect for the sovereignty and territorial integrity of other countries. But that may be about to change. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken says China may start providing lethal support, arms and ammunition to Russia. And as the conflict drags on, China seems to have its sights on reshaping the global order. Russia's front line in Ukraine has advanced, retreated and inched forward since its invasion a year ago. But one thing has stayed constant. European hopes that Russia's biggest ally could push it to end the destruction. It is important for us that China does not choose Russia's side. We expect China to fully use its influence on Russia to bring Russia to respect international law. I said to President Xi that it's important for China to exert its influence on Russia. China has often called for peace negotiations. We have both talked about the current Ukraine crisis. And the two sides both hoped that this crisis can be ended as soon as possible. The situation can be eased, and it really must not be escalated. But Beijing looks reluctant to clip Russian wings. Before Russia invaded Ukraine, President Xi and Putin declared a no-limits partnership between their countries. And they've met in person since then, and more face-to-face -face meetings are planned. Um, because um, Putin didn't win the war quickly, it's had to rethink its relationship while keeping this very strong alliance intact. So China's um, main focus is to make sure that it continues to trade heavily with the West while also maintaining its close friendship with, with Russia. One limit on this no-limits partnership may be Russia's threats to use nuclear weapons in the conflict. In a statement, President Xi called on the international community to jointly oppose such a move. But China may be offering Russia material support in the war, despite threats of more sanctions from the U.S. government. U.S.-based security researchers C4ADS allege that Chinese companies are exporting equipment to sanctioned Russian defense firms. But Beijing says its exports to Russia are in line with its laws. China is already benefiting from the war in Ukraine in other ways. Russia now needs China more than China needs Russia. And um, I think China is always prepared to, to use this leverage that it has to its own advantage. Um, and I think it's hoping it's already taking advantage of cheap energy. Um, it's also looking at the uh, invasion of Ukraine uh, to see what it could mean for its own ambitions in, in Taiwan and in the South China Sea. As Moscow's troops struggle on in Ukraine, China is working towards its long-term goal of expanding its borders and influence on the global stage. And for more, I'm joined now by DW's chief international editor, Richard Walker. Richard, um, can you tell us, how can we see China's position 
evolving here with regard to, to the war in Ukraine? Yeah, well, as we saw uh, very well explained in that piece there and also with, with those comments from our colleague Clifford Coonan, um, it, essentially we see, I mean, on the one hand, China would stress that it's independent in this, that it, the, the, that it is neutral, that it doesn't have any stake in this con uh, conflict and that it doesn't like to see wars and it wants to see this war stop. Um, but it is providing, has been providing support to Russia in two effective ways. Uh, in one way, um, economic, and in another way, diplomatic. In the economic way, um, what we're seeing is that um, Russia has been able to divert some of its hydrocarbon exports to uh, China that it would otherwise have so sold uh, elsewhere, that China I is happy to keep buying, um, you know, Russian oil, for instance. Um, <clears throat> and on the diplomatic front, uh, that's even pot potentially even more important, that, that China has has never voted in the same way as the West, for instance, in, 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 at the United Nations um, in condemning this war, in, in calling uh, Russia uh, to stop its invasion. Um, and what we saw just towards the end of last year, we had a lot of movement in Chinese politics. Xi Jinping, kind of China's supreme leader, was was confirmed into, into another period of office, um, you know, cementing his, his grip on power there. And he had a meeting with Xi Jinping just before the, with, with uh, Vladimir Putin, a, a virtual meeting just before the end of the year. And Xi Jinping was quoted as saying, China stands ready to join hands with Russia and all other progressive forces around the world who oppose hegemony and power politics. And some people looking at uh, what Russia is doing in Ukraine might think, well, this sounds like, looks a lot like hegemony and power politics, but that is aimed at America. And this is really China's kind of big picture uh, issue is that it sees America um, as, uh, it, as the impediment to its rise uh, as a global power. Um, and any help that it can get uh, on the diplomatic side against that, um, it seeks. And this is why it has a strong incentive to kind of align itself more and more closely uh, with Russia, now to the extent that that is fueling concerns that maybe even China will start providing some weapons uh, to Russia. At the same time, China now is saying that it wants to present a peace plan, so trying to say, no, 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 we're still, we're still uh, independent, we're still on the fence, we want to potentially even mediate at this point. So, so quite a fine line that it's walking, uh, but to say that China is neutral on this war is, is, is really not true. Do you think that we could say that China is watching how the West <coughs> is, is, is reacting here? Um, you know, is it a thinking ahead to how potentially the West could react to a, to a Chinese invasion of Taiwan? Yeah, well, I think almost everybody is watching the invasion of Ukraine and thinking, OK, what is the potential read across to another, you you know, another very serious potential conflict that could uh, emerge across the Taiwan Strait. You know, China sees Taiwan as part of its territory. Uh, it says that it retains the, the right to attack it, to, to take control of it. Um, and China will certainly be watching, you know, what's going on in Ukraine, the way Ukraine is fighting, the extent to which the, the West is supporting it, and thinking, OK, what does that, how does that transfer across to Taiwan? Of course, there are differences too. Imagine if Taiwan was invaded, how well would the West be able to supply weapons to Taiwan, given that it's an island compared to what it's able to do in Ukraine? So there are similarities potentially, but also um, differences. And we got a chance just over the weekend, uh, there was the, the Munich Security Conference, which we've been covering a lot in the last few days, this massive gathering on security and defence. We got a chance to speak to a former member of China's military, a, a senior officer, uh, and to ask him what is China's perspective on this war. And I think we can just play that clip now. Let's take a listen. Being a Chinese, I sometimes feel flattered in that nowadays everything seems to be related to, to China. Even about this war in, in the heart of Europe, which has nothing to do with China, but the people would still say which side do you want to take and all your questions seems to be suggesting indirectly that china should have a clear-cut position and this actually is a kind of asking china to take a side and then we have this question whether china would be a serious mediator this is what i learned at this conference could china just uh, you know persuade uh, russia you know make use of influence uh, about, uh, you know, what the Russia should not do, so on and so forth. And then it even give people some imagination as to how a similar conflict might occur in Taiwan Strait.
Yeah, so all these things, what I mentioned is, because this war has nothing to do with China, but still it invites so many people's uh, imagination or discussion about the role of China. Now, I did speak to members uh, of the Chinese delegation in Munich, and it's interesting, you know, they, the, the line they're trying to walk, at the same time, they, 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 they're coming out potentially with a peace plan, but at the same time, they really try to downplay uh, any sense that they really have influence uh, over Vladimir Putin. They don't want to kind of be, be cast in this, in this role as sort of Vladimir Putin's sort of uh, overlord. Um, so it's going to be so interesting to watch what comes from the Chinese side during the course of this week. Um, there's some expectation that this peace plan could be coming in days. Yeah. Um, just a quick question about uh, India, Richard. Is it a reliable uh, partner for the West, sort of providing a counterbalance in the region? Well, um, I mean, India has its own problems with China, certainly, but it has a close historical relationship with Russia. Russia has historically been India's biggest uh, provider of weapons, and it has a close relationship going back uh, to the Cold War with, with, uh, with Russia. Um, in India has been very much insisting on uh, an independent, you know, being on the fence, a neutral position on this war. If you see, like, China so far has been as being neutral but inclined towards uh, 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 Russia, at least in their presentation of things, then you might say India is perhaps neutral but perhaps slightly inclined to in, in the other direction in favour of Ukraine if you read between the lines of the statements that they put out um, about this. But they are determined to, to, to stay, like, not to get kind of completely dragged into this. Um, uh, not to be, you know, pulled uh, along by the West completely. It's going to be interesting to watch at the end of this week, Olaf Scholz, the German Chancellor, expected to go to India. Um, he will definitely be speaking to uh, Narendra Modi, who we uh, see in the picture back there mm -hmm. uh, with Vladimir Putin, trying to pull him off that fence a little bit. We'll see how far he gets. We'll be watching closely. DW's Chief International Editor, Richard Walker, thank you. OK, we're going to take a closer look now at the impact that the conflict in Ukraine is having on African nations. Russia's invasion of Ukraine has fueled a food crisis in many African nations and also pushed up the energy prices. But many African nations have long-standing ties with Russia and some have deepened those relationships since Russia invaded Ukraine. This is Jim Flo Bakery in Kaongware, one of Nairobi's informal settlements. Before the war, they used to bake up to 7,000 mandazis, bread rolls and buns here daily. But with the Ukraine war, wheat prices doubled, deliveries were delayed, quantities decreased, and the baked items were reduced in size. The bakery and its staff had to make drastic changes to stay afloat. We had to go several days without working. So if we were working for six days, now you find we were working for three to four days. Yeah. So units, obviously, they had to reduce and uh, some employees are not at the payment because we do, we do, we do daily payments, yeah, daily wages as part of payments. For wheat farmer Michael, just three hours to the west of Nairobi, the wheat shortage combined with higher prices would normally have meant increased income. But that was not the case, as he depended on fertilizer supply from Ukraine and Russia. Initially, we used to buy a 50 kilogram bag of fertilizer at 2,800 shillings. But in the recent past, we have been buying the same 50 kilogram bag at 6,300 shillings. So even if the buyers are coming in plenty, the cost of production is too high, and as a result, the profit margins have become very little. With over 40% of wheat supply in Africa coming from Russia and Ukraine, experts say it's time Africa stopped relying on food from outside the continent and found alternative means to feed her most vulnerable people. Economist Exen Iraqi says that African countries should learn lessons from this crisis and make changes. We would want the government to do more so that we have things like strategic oil reserves. We have things like strategic, strategic green reserves. We would also want the countries in the country in future to, di to di diversify the source of their food so that we don't just get wheat from Ukraine, we can get wheat from Argentina. So we must also make farming cool so that people are proud of it. And the only way to do that is to give it support. Whether it is banks, whether it is the government, whether it is research institutes, we need to give support to farmers. Over the past year, Africans have had to face the high price of their dependence on wheat from Ukraine and Russia. A wake-up call to how a far-away war can hit close to home.
Let's go to Nairobi now and speak there to DW's Felix Moringa, who filed that report. Felix, you, you mentioned the need for Africa to decrease its reliance on foreign imports in your report. Can you tell us, has any progress been made in that regard? Uh, good afternoon. <clears throat> yes, there's been some effort within, uh, in that regard. Last year, the Africa Development Bank promised that they will invest uh, up to 10 billion US dollars to ensure that Africa becomes uh, the global uh, food basket, uh, especially uh, in 2023 onwards. Uh, the, the process is still ongoing, but uh, no major changes have taken place. So Africa is still remaining at the same place. Remember, towards the end of last year, uh, Africans were still relying on uh, grains from uh, the different nations to uh, feed some of the most vulnerable people who've been uh, vastly affected by the drought that has been uh, taking place. And also, uh, the supply has been delayed over the time because, uh, of course, there was the disruption in the global food chain. So is there any effort that has taken place? Yes, but not enough has been done to ensure that Africa is now reliant on its own production. And, of course, finding new trading partners, changing local food production, all of that takes time. So what are some potentially faster solutions to protect people from, from hunger and poverty? So the last time the Africa Union leaders met, they uh, agreed that it was important for the Africa Continental Free Trade Area Agreement to be implemented faster so that uh, approximately 30 million uh, tons of uh, food could be exchanged among the African countries. At least that would ensure that if maybe a country like Uganda has more food than Kenya, then Uganda can actually transport the food to Kenya and uh, African countries can be able to share food amongst themselves. Secondly, there's also the issue of uh, making agriculture to be lucrative to young people because uh, the average age of uh, farmers, pro uh, possibly in Kenya, is uh, 60. So uh, with a 60 year old, you don't expect them to be as productive as a young person. And lastly, it will be to ensure that uh, farm inputs, fertilizers, and other uh, things that the farmers need to produce more are availed at a uh, subsidized rate and uh, cheaper to the farmers. Felix, thanks so much for that. That's Felix Moringa reporting from Nairobi. Now, the region most directly affected by events in Ukraine is Europe. The conflict in Ukraine has revived memories of war on a scale not seen since World War II. It's also awakened fears that a new type of Cold War could emerge with Russia. The war has had an impact on the economy of every single country in Europe. And it's also drawn European nations closer together, with many supplying weapons and funding to Ukraine. Our correspondent, Rosie Burchart, joins us now from the European Council in Brussels. Hi there, Rosie. Uh, EU foreign ministers are looking right now at a tenth package of sanctions on Russia in Brussels. Um, can you tell us more about what these sanctions are likely to target? Well, that's been one of Ukraine's big asks from the beginning, hasn't it? Tougher sanctions on Moscow to try and tighten the screws on Russia's ability to keep financing its war in Ukraine. And EU ministers, as we speak, are looking at, as you said, a tenth round of sanctions. Now, in the past, they have banned imports of most Russian oil, banned imports of Russian coal. With this new round, they're, like, they're looking at uh, around 10 billion euros worth of export restrictions. So that means banning Europe European companies from exporting to Russia key types of equipment which could be used for military purposes and they're also expected to be sanctioning targeting people deemed as propagandists no exact wording on what that might mean but it could be for example artists singers performers TV presenters now Ukraine of course will welcome news of, tough, of tougher sanctions but would like to see these sanctions be even tougher still one thing Ukraine has called for is sanctions targeting Russia's nuclear sector that so far is not on the table based on the discussions I've been having with ministers. But of course, Ukraine has another very big ask, and that is to one day join this European Union, not just to be a guest or an invitee, but to have a permanent seat at this table. And while Ukraine did become an official candidate for European Union membership last year in a move that few had ever predicted or expected so quickly before the full-scale invasion, well, there still appears to be a very long road ahead. So while one of the messages to Ukraine is that 
It belongs in this European Union family, according to officials and leaders. The other message behind closed doors is also one of expectation management, because this is a process which can take years, if not more than a decade. DW Brussels correspondent Rosie Birch, I will have to leave it there, but thank you so much for that. Now, Germany is one of the biggest providers of aid and weapons to Ukraine. And today, the defence minister visited Ukrainian troops training on German-made battle tanks in the northwest of Germany. Boris Pistorius invited Ukrainian boxing legend Vladimir Klitschko and the Ukrainian ambassador along for the visit. Ukraine's armed forces are being trained to use the Leopard 2 tanks, as well as Marder infantry fighting vehicles. Berlin is leading a coalition of countries scrambling to provide Ukraine with two battalions of Leopard 2s in the coming months. Kyiv says they're critical to pushing back Russia. And DW political correspondent Julia Saudelli is at the military training ground in Münster in uh, northern Germany. Julia, the G G German defence minister has just been meeting Ukrainian troops uh, being trained on the German Leopard tanks. I guess this visit shows just how far Germany's position has shifted since the beginning of the war, doesn't it? Yes, definitely. If we look at uh, where we started just a year ago, it is uh, quite a difference that we see compared to then. It started with uh, Germany committing to deliver 5,000 helmets to the Ukrainian army, and that was seen as laughable. And throughout this last year, we've seen Germany's partners, Ukraine itself, pushing for Germany to always commit more. And the starting point was that uh, Germany had a standing policy that meant that it would not deliver weapons to countries involved in an armed conflict. And wow, it has quite been an important change since then. We're seeing now the commitment to deliver Leopard 2 tanks, state-of-the-art tanks to Ukraine. And uh, this is something that uh, Chancellor Olaf Scholz is wanting uh, to push uh, forward with uh, quite some speed right now. And speed, of course, being of the essence, as uh, Volodymyr Zelensky always, uh, always says. So when can Ukraine actually expect to get the first of these German tanks? Germany committed to delivering the first uh, 14 Leopard 2 tanks uh, within three months, so that would mean by the end of April. But obviously there are logistical challenges there, getting the tanks to Ukraine, but also all the maintenance systems. And there is talk of creating a coordinating center in Poland to then be able to deliver German tanks, but also tanks coming from other countries to Ukraine. But definitely Germany has promised that they will do all they can to get the tanks there as quickly as possible. Political correspondent Julia Sardelli, thank you so much for that. Now, the world's largest annual defence gathering, the Munich Security Conference, has just wrapped up here in Germany. DW's Terry Schultz was there and she caught up with the US journalist and author Anne Applebaum for some perspective on how the conflict in Ukraine has affected Europe. What will be the geopolitical consequences uh, of, of the war on Ukraine, beyond Ukraine, obviously? This is a war that has changed Europe forever. Uh, the assumptions that we had about Europe being forever safe, about the borders being unchangeable, about our laws on human rights and on uh, conventions on genocide, uh, all those things that we've been taking for granted for so many decades, this is now over. Um, this is a war that moves us into a different era, uh, one in which Europe may have to defend itself, may have to even begin to produce weapons and ammunition at a much higher rate than it expected. Um, and it will have to, it will eventually end with a new set of security guarantees one way or the other. Uh, thinking up what, what will be the new shape of NATO, how will we prevent a war like this from happening in the future, and what will, how will we, in specific, specifically, how will we guarantee the security of Ukraine? You're a Russia watcher. Um, should we have known? Should we have seen signs that there could be another shooting war in Europe? Or uh, is anyone forgiven for not thinking that this kind of war would happen again? Actually, Putin made it very clear for a long time that he had aims on its neighbors. He, 
He invaded Georgia. Um, he invaded Ukraine in 2014. Uh, he helped with the invasion of Syria, which is not on his borders, but it shows his ambition. Um, we weren't paying attention when he was telling us that he was interested in reconstructing the Soviet empire, um, which he would now call the Russian empire. Um, and, and, and yes, I'm afraid we are to blame for not listening, not catching the warning signs, and above all, for not thinking about the consequences for Ukraine and for NATO. And so does NATO need to now expand and let Ukraine in despite um, possibly having Crimea not freed? I mean, is this, is this what Ukraine needs and what NATO um, owes it? I, the, the, war will, the war will end when Russia changes. So the war will end when the Russians conclude that it was a mistake when they understand that the Russian Empire cannot be reconstructed and that that era is over. Um, how we get to that point, there are many different ways. Uh, one of the ways will be military victory from Ukraine. Um, and there may be also, we may be able to use sanctions. We may eventually be able to use diplomacy. Um, but that will be the way that it changes, and it will have to end in some, um, with some new security guarantees for the continent. I can't tell you what they are now because I don't know what the, you know, what the state of the world will be next week or even six months from now. Uh, so, but, but that is how it will end. And are you on the are you of, of the position that it's no time for Ukraine to talk peace right now? That there needs to be more uh, military superiority before anyone should talk to Ukraine about discussing this with Moscow. So right now there is no one to talk to, because Putin has made it clear that his war aims remain the same. His war aim is to conquer Ukraine, take Kiev, create a puppet state. So right now there isn't a conversation to have, and there are people trying to have those conversations. So it's not as if no one has thought of it. Um, as I said, the war will end when Russia changes, when, like France and Algeria, or like Britain and Ireland, when Russia understands that it is no longer an imperial power and that the age of empire is over. And we have to help Russia get to that point. And one of the ways we can do it is by helping Ukraine take its territory back. Thank you very much. Thank you. U.S. author and Applebaum speaking to DW there. Now, the war in Ukraine has been documented by journalists and photographers who've captured searing images that have often shocked the world. People fleeing to get as far from the front lines as possible. The massacre of Ukrainian civilians in Bucha galvanized international opinion, an early glimpse of the horrors of the war in Ukraine. A moment of triumph for Ukraine, hitting a crucial Russian supply bridge to Crimea. But just last month, a reminder of the civilian toll, an apartment building hit by a cruise missile, killing dozens. Russia invades Ukraine, attacking from air, land and sea. Within days, millions of people fled the fighting, leaving everything. A maternity hospital hit by a missile. For those who stayed behind, towns laid to waste, people brutalized and killed. A steel plant becomes a symbol of resistance, but falls to an overwhelming Russian onslaught. Moments of pride as Ukraine struck back. As winter came, a deadly war of attrition set in. A year on, nowhere in Ukraine is truly safe in a war that still has no end in sight. Ekaterina Schulman is a Russian political scientist and a Robert Bosch fellow here in Berlin. Thanks so much for joining us, Ekaterina. Can I ask you, if you think back uh, a year ago, February the 20th, 2022, did you see the war coming? And when did you realize that it was actually going to happen? Uh, I was one of those among many of my colleagues, political scientists, experts, uh, who did not think a full-scale invasion highly probable. 
Uh, we were seeing, of course, all the signs that the whole world was seeing, but uh, it must be admitted that we have seen much the same thing in 2021. Also, uh, military training that looked much like a military build-up, uh, escalation of public rhetoric, uh, declarations of official figures, and then uh, the meeting in Geneva of the presidents of uh, United States and Russia. So in 2022, it looked very much like a repetition of the same thing. Uh, most of our judgments were based on our observations of how Russian political system is constructed, what it is able and not able to do. And now, a year uh, from the beginning of the war, it must be said that while we have definitely underestimated the probability of the invasion which did take place, we have based this assumption on correct observation. A Russian political regime is not a military one, and it's not very successful. Well, let's put it this way. It's much more successful in uh, propaganda, uh, presenting a show, talking its own people and external audiences into believing what it wants mm -hmm. than in actual warfare or military intelligence. I wanted to ask you that, actually. You know, how has President Putin kept the Russian people generally supportive of this cause, of the, the necessity of what has obviously always in Russia been called the spe special military operation? By a number of means, by, by no means unknown to other authoritarian systems of the world. It's a mixture of uh, informational monopoly, which is almost complete, uh, repressive measures, and uh, what I would call social assistant measures, especially to the uh, poorer classes and to uh, those traders of society which are dependent on the state, the so-called budgetniki, the budgetary workers. So people have hardly an informational alternative. Uh, they are are terrorized into agreeing, at least publicly agreeing, with an official point of view, and they have an interest in preserving the status quo to which they owe their livelihood. So there's nothing very unnatural in that, and we need not look into for answers into imperial mentality or historical tradition or whatever. Uh, I would say that any society in the world in such circumstances, under such constraints, would act in much the same way. Mm -hmm. uh, now that the year has passed, we may, I think, assume that at least by this point, what is called totalitarian transformation of society is not taking place. Mm -hmm. Russia is still this atomized, depoliticized society that it was a year ago. Again, surprising as it may seem for an external um, audience. And, I, and if I could ask you, you know, everyday Russians, how, how have they fared during this year of war? Well, we certainly have the polling data, which, with all the uh, peculiarities of polling in a non-free society, we cannot do without. We cannot take everything at face value, but we have to watch those markers as well. Uh, what we can see, for the society in general, the real wake-up call was not February 24th, but September 21st, the declaration of mobilization. Again, it may sound surprising, but... Uh, from February to September, I can say most of the people, but many of the people did not realize that anything particular is happening. If you only have it in evening news, 15 minutes a day, which you watch in your kitchen, uh, you can hear that, well, the uh, country's bosses are talking about Ukraine, they're always talking about Ukraine. There's always some sort of special something going on somewhere, and of course, our side is winning, so it's nothing much. Your everyday life has not changed, but when mobilization started, that was a different thing. All right. Ekaterina Schulman, Russian political scientist and Bosch Fellow here in Berlin. Thanks so much for joining us here at DW. Thank you. I am Anya Coopers mckinnon and you have been watching DW's special on the war in Ukraine as it approaches the one-year anniversary of the Russian invasion.